Great having you here tonight uh, to discuss your new book, which I had read oh, weeks ago now, whenever you released it. I was like right on this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my big question is why now? Why write an autobiography at this age? You probably have another 70 years on this earth. Uh, <laughs> of course, you could have sequels to this. Well, here's the deal. I started to write this book many, many years ago. This book. I just wanted to write a family history for my children. You know, I have four daughters, and I wanted them to know where, where the DeVitos came from. You know, so that's why it starts in, in Italy with my grandparents coming over. I was fortunate enough to have my father and mother uh, live long lives. My father uh, passed away when he was 91 years old. My mother, 89 years old. Uh, so I got to interview them. Uh, I still have the cassette tapes of me interviewing them. Uh, and uh, my aunts, a couple of my aunts I interviewed. So the whole uh, family thing. But, you know, you get outside and, and meet uh, uh, people who are curious like yourself. And you say, you would say to me, uh, tell me a story about what it's like to be on the road. And I would say something and then somebody would say, you know, you sure had a book with this stuff. So it's like, okay. But when I started to write the, the, that part of it was when me and Billy had the falling out. So I was the angry old man at the time. Uh, and um, so some of the things I was writing were like, not, not nice. There weren't nice things, you know. I didn't want to have anything to do with the music anymore. I, I wouldn't listen to it on the radio. It wasn't until the Lords of 52nd Street with Richie Canada, Russell Javis, and the late Doug Stegmaier, we were inducted into the, music, uh, the Long Island Music Hall of Fame, right? I didn't want to go. They, they talked me into going. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, we were supposed to play one song at the, at the event, and I didn't even go to sound check. I sent somebody else to do the sound check. I didn't want to have anything to do with the music, you know? So we get there, we play the song, we get our awards, we play the song, and the crowd reaction was so great that we played five songs, you know? After it was done, me and Richie and Russell sat down and said, why don't we do this for real? You know, get a, put the band together, get the other guys to do it. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, cover bands and tribute bands are making a lot of money on the yeah. parts that we created. We are the guys. How weird is that? That others are playing the music you created and yeah. <laughs> perfect timing to like, hey, these are the guys. The right. Guys did this. So, so um, as I was learning the songs, relearning them, uh, I started to fall in love with them again because all I could think about was how much fun we had in the studio and how great it was to travel the world with these songs and how many millions of people we made happy with these songs so i had the songs back i'm playing with richie and russell the only thing i don't have now is the guy that i used to look at every night and he used to look at me we'd exchange these views and just by our the way we look at each other we could tell how the night was going is it going to be tough for him is it going to be tough for me is the crowd reaction great you know i'll never forget his face in the soviet union the first night we played there was no reaction. I remember he, that well. Oh, yeah. He looked at me at the piano. He just bent down like this and he went, we're dead. <laughs> yeah. I remember him saying, I am nervous. I remember yeah. he did the live radio broadcast. I was like, how bad could it be over there? Wait a minute. Right. So that was the only part that was missing in my life. So I thought, I'm going to reach out to him. I'm going to say, and I told him, I wrote, wrote the drum feud, a drum piano feud has to be over. It's been going on too long. I, I was really disappointed in the way it ended. And he wrote me right back immediately and said, uh, yeah, I was disappointed too in the way it ended. Um, and I said, let's meet for some meet, you know? And it turned out to be a great meeting. We just sat and talked for an hour and a half about, you know, who's sick, who's passed away that we know that has worked with us. And um, what our families are like now. Nothing about the past, everything about yeah. what it's like now. And it turns out that our, our, our lives still ran parallel while we right. weren't together for 15 years, weren't talking to each other for 15 years. He had two children, he got remarried again, had two children. Yeah. So uh, I think their ages are, are like maybe uh, five and two or something like that. I, I got married again. I have one that's only three years old. You know, so it's amazing. We, same generation, and you work together for so long, and you're doing the same thing in your absence. Yeah, it's unreal. 
unreal, you know? I mean, it was weird. <laughs> it's a whole but, new life. It really is. I'm sure it is. I mean, you know, it seems like you're rejuvenated and uh, not only you, you, you're parallel with the Lords of 52nd Street, the right. tribute band, you're not really a tribute band, you're the architects of this music. Right. And also the Slim Kings, where yes. you do original music. So you're quite busy these days. Well, yeah. Well, the, the pandemic has kind of slowed things down. But recently we've been doing these drive-in gigs with the Lords. Uh, we're going to do a video broadcast, I guess, with the Slim Kings. We haven't played in a while, but it's going to be fun to do it, you know, to get together with these guys again. You know, I just love to play. I still love it. I loved it when I was young, and I still love it as much now, you know. It's great in the book. You really chronicle those very early years, all those influences. You have a very sharp memory. How did that all come? Did, did another, uh, somebody help you along the way just getting those memories onto paper? It's just no. amazing. You, you, all these names from your childhood and all the bands you were in, I think yeah. it's incredible. Well, you know, the childhood part, uh, I, I had this one girlfriend, her name was Regina. She's in the book. She, uh, we, we've actually, uh, after 48 years, have re reconnected again, another one that I reconnected with. And, uh, you know, so those memories, I, I'll never forget. She was my first girlfriend. You know, forget your first love, you know. So that I'll never forget. Uh, the older bands were always a stepping stone and a learning experience for me. So I don't forget them. You know, I was always the, the, um, the new guy in the band. I was the youngest and probably the worst one in the band. So I learned from each one of them. And some of the experiences were unbelievable. You know, this, this is my road, what took me from letter A to letter to playing with, the, with one of the most famous um, single artists in the world. These are the roads that I took. That's what the book is about. A lot of guys write books about like, uh, you see, you see uh, documentaries like, um, uh, 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 six, 12 feet from stardom, or you see um, uh, the wrecking crew. And it's like, yeah, we recorded this song and it became a smash hit. And we recorded this song and it became a smash hit. The, this book is about like, whoa, hang on. This is not American Idol. You know? Right, exactly. You, yeah. you know, paid dues. <laughs> yes. Seriously paid dues. Yes. Billy Joel was not one of those kids that went to his uh, sister's wedding and, and, uh, 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 the, the bride asked the, the band, the wedding band, if he could sing with them because he sings good. You know, that's what the American Idol people were like, you know. It's like, this was paying dues. And, um, you know, I actually put myself in Billy's shoes for this book to see why he did what he did, the, the, the things he did over the years. Now, I realized Billy um, has so many responsibilities. I mean, He's got to write a new album, right? His name is on the marquee, first of all, when we play live. It's not you were talking about the pressure, yeah, it's of, yeah. Of, of having to do that. Have to write a new, new album with 14 songs. Four of those songs have to be top 40 hits, right? Plays piano, sings, and, and he's doing all this, wearing all these different hats while he's dealing with a family at home. He's dealing with that. And I'm the drummer that plays along with him, and I'm complaining because I want to go out on the tour in April and he wants to go out in May. <laughs> you know, he says, I need another month of rest. Why? Let's go. <laughs> you know? but, so uh, I put myself in his shoes and I saw why he did. This man has had a career that, that has gone over so many decades. And there's a reason that he, he, he oh, did. Yeah. It's hard to stay alive. You have to stay current. You have to, you, and, and you do that by changing personnel sometimes, you know? So why was it in the early days more pressure on an artist like Billy to perform, to, to get top 40 hits, to churn those out rather than say of any other performers? Was that just some, an unsaid thing? And, and, or was that something in the contract that just said, Hey, you got to have hit singles out here. We need at least three or four per album. No, I think the key to making the hit, those hit singles was, well, Phil Ramone was asked uh, at one time, what made Billy Joel the phenomenon that he turned out to be. And Phil said he wrote great songs and his band came up with great arrangements. But I think it was Phil Ramone who honed those songs into top 40 hits. You know, uh, 
he, he really, he, he, we called him uncle Phil. He was, he was, let's call him the fifth Beatle. You know, that's, that's what he, he was to us. And he told us, you know, I, I, in the book, I talk about the, the argument I had over my life yeah. when, you know, I didn't want to play I didn't know that. That's a great tidbit. Yeah. And he, and he slammed the thing on the table and said, you know, what have you been in this business for 20 minutes? You're going to tell me what you're not going to do. It's like, Have wow. That <laughs> yeah. That moment of like looking at greatness and, and learning from greatness and not even know that you're learning something so powerful right now. You know? Yeah. Phil Ramone also has a good book out uh, that he wrote yeah. years ago on records and explains how the process of The Stranger came together. Right. What right. a genius. And he yeah. worked with legends, too. And, and so have you. Uh, beyond Billy Joel, uh, you right. worked with E.B. Snow, Karen Carpenter. I mean, so, what an array of talents that you've Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It's fun now, too, going into the studio sometimes with these young artists that aren't necessarily famous. They're, they're, they just got a record deal or something like that. But it's different because I used to go in with the whole band. Like when we did Karen Carpenter, it was myself, Russell, uh, Doug Stegmaier, I was in, David Brown was in, uh, involved on it. But now it's like I get a phone call and like this guy uh, is on Curb Records, let's say. And I walk in there and he's got 14 songs that are already done. They, he just did them with a drum machine and now he wants live drums on them. You know, so it's that kind of thing. It's very rare. Uh, me and Richie Cannata just did a, 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 a thing with uh, this guy named Jimmy Hook. He has, he's a songwriter out of uh, Ohio. And he uh, wanted the band to be in the room. They had to build this whole thing around his piano so the p drums wouldn't leak into his microphone. He sang while he played, just like Billy did in the early days. We all played together, me, the bass, and the, and the uh, piano. It was great. It was fun doing that. I like doing that best. Yeah. You know? Well, it shows in the, the, the Billy Joel records that you right. have worked on. It's just phenomenal. But you were a very big part uh, being the architect of all the songs, album tracks and singles. And I like how in the book you go through many tracks about how right. things could come together. Uh, most interesting one is Keeping the Faith, about how very technical stuff uh, with the drums and how you go into that, how the fills happen, how the production comes together. It's, it's very interesting, but it's not so technical that right. a normal reader would be like, oh, I don't get any of this stuff. Right. Well, I'm not technical. You know, I, I never took a lesson. Uh, uh, maybe one from somebody when, when, I, when I told a guy when he's going to teach me how to play like Ringo and he said Ringo stinks you know and it was like that's the end of the, that's the end yeah, I, 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 I had to learn myself you know you're like hey I don't see you playing to all these screaming girls uh, what's exactly. up here <laughs> exactly. exactly you know if anybody tells you they got into music to make money or something like that and not to meet girls they're lying it's all about girls <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of good stories in this book that come along with it. There are high times, the great times and the low times, and sure. typical rock and roll stories, but they're, they're fun. It's kind of like almost famous in a way from that movie, but you, you got some of your own good stories there. Right. Well, well basically the story is about, uh, it, it's actually a, a story about two friends that parted. It's a story about how these immigrants came over and two generations later that one of them, play, one of the uh, offspring plays with one of the most famous single artists in the world. It, it's also, it's my story about the roads I took to be standing here right now talking to you on this video, on this uh, internet. These are the roads I took. <clears throat> Some of them were very dark. And it's just read in the book. Some of them were very dark. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to get off those roads. Like uh, Doug Stegmaier did not. He got on a dark road and he did not get off that road and he ended up ending his life. You know, so... Um, it, it's a beautiful it, it's, chapter you did on him. It was really, really... Uh, yeah, I remember very okay. well seeing you guys perform together. So yeah, he was just incredible. But you see that in this business, people who struggle and they're not getting the help that they need. So I know you were involved with Rockers for Recovery with Ricky Bird. Right, rockers for Recovery, yeah. Now we do a thing called, it's called Clean Getaway. Clean Getaway, Clean cool. Getaway. Yeah. Ricky Bird, we got to give him the credit there. I met yeah, you Ricky and Bird. Ricky. Oh, it was, I met you and Ricky about 15 years ago because I was writing about Camp Jam. 
uh, met in Doraville, Georgia, where you spent some time here. Uh, so you've got some good yes. stories about Doraville. Yeah, uh, yeah. Those were the experiences. I mean, those were, you know, you don't think of it as like you're learning right now. You are in the learning process. You don't think about it when it's happening, but you, I look back and it's like, wow, I learned so much. The Atlanta Rhythm section, they were, they were playing, showing us how to do it, you know? Oh, just incredible talent there. Yeah. Wow. And what was the process like, though, when you would say, OK, we're going to do a project. Billy Joel is he's how many was he do records every year? Because 77, 78, 79, 1980, th those years. I mean, one record after another. Was that part of a contract? Did he have to do so much work in a short amount of time? Yeah, I think he had a, a record a year. One, one album a year he signed for. Yeah. So. um now that he hasn't done any records, he's, he owes Columbia a lot. But, uh, you know, I mean, he can't never break away from that contract because he still hasn't fulfilled it, you know, by stopping writing, you know. So, uh, but yeah, the process was uh, one record a year. And uh, it was funny because I did a, a, a drum camp in Nashville. And it was with this, uh, my dear friend, uh, Rich Redman, who plays country music. And uh, he had a whole bunch of country guys come in. And myself, I was the token rock drummer, right? So these yeah. guys got up and, and they were asked, what's it like when you go into the studio? Well, they said like, uh, uh, when they go in like with, with uh, Justin Aldean or something like that, or, or a country artist that's big, the country artists, they, they play a demo that sounds like a complete record already. And they tell the, the, the musicians, I want you to copy this note for note, mm. and we're gonna record it just to make it sound better. All right? Okay. Then they asked me, what's it like when you go in the studio? I said, well, the guy that I work with might have a song. He might have a song. <laughs> He'll have bits and pieces of little songs. And it's up to us, we put it together, all together, together you know, so, as, a, as a group. Back in the day, if, if Billy Joel says, look, we're, we're working on a new project here, he would come in with the songs. How did the melodies and everything come together? It was usually melodies first, lyrics next. No, no, this is, what, this is how he wrote. He would come in with a, with a little piece of something, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, he had a, 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 just a, a thing that just, just went like this and he would just hum it. Really fast. Went that up a no song, right? And then it went. Then the next part of the song was. Right? Yeah. So he comes into the studio and it's like, I got this this idea. And then we're like, how about that part you have? Remember that little bit and piece you have that goes, and it pieced together like a song like Uptown Girl comes together. A lot of those songs came together like that. Yeah, yeah he's just, just hearing, he, it's like earworm. They call that earworm. You're, you're yes. getting pieces of melodies in your head and then yeah. lyrics come after that. He had a cassette player and uh, the cassette that it was in the cassette player all the time were all his little bits and pieces. Like he used to play this one thing at home. It went like this. Bum, ba, bum, bum, bum. Da, 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 da. Real fast. Da, 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 da. Right? Yeah. I said, at the end of Leningrad, he just, and until we came to Leningrad, and he stopped. And yeah. I said, Billy, you know the thing you play really fast? What if we play it really slow now? It sounded like it came from Russia, you know? From Russia, right. Yeah. So, grand feeling, yeah. So it was really important to remember the bits and pieces that he had. And that's really, how tough is that to convert that into, hey, let's make this into a song. You, you figure it out from there. It's like, okay, you're on. Go do the drums now. It's like, yeah, right. It's like, okay, this, this is going to sound good. 
So he would come in sometimes with a little bit of piece and, and he'd run it by the band. And if it swung with band, he would go home and now finish the song, you know, put the, get the words together and everything. Yeah. What was it like though with Innocent Man? Here is this is the early eighties, you know, new waves going on all like that, and he's he's wanting to do you know stuff from the fifties, you know, early sixties. It, I mean, buck the trend, and the thing sold phenomenally well. You guys recorded it pretty fast, like within two weeks. Yeah, he, he turned to me at one point when we recorded it, and we were done doing the basic tracks. He goes, "This is going to be a bomb. It was too much fun to make." You know. <laughs> It, it's weird how that happens in life. It's, you, you know, you think, oh, I'm doing this so fast. Nobody's going to care about this thing. The previous right. record, Nylon Curtain, which Porter's hired out into his Sergeant Peppers, as he's called that. It took, took a year to rank that one. A year. <laughs> and, and, and the recording itself, I think that, that is digitally recorded. It's one of the earliest ones that are actually was like totally digital from what I've, I, I see in the liner notes here. Yeah, With, you know, 1982. That was like way ahead of its time. Right, right. Um, yeah, but that took a long time. But also because not only curtain took a long time because they were they were getting ready to knock down A and R, where we had done The Stranger for the Second Street, Glass Houses. All those records were done at A and R, and that was Phil's home. And they, they sold the building, and the, they were going to destroy the studio and everything. So we were searching for new studios in Nala, during the Nala and Curtain time. You know, it's phenomenal. Still sounds fresh. Uh, a lot of that stands the test of time. I would say the most dated out of the catalog might be probably the bridge because he was trying to be so trendy at that time. Yeah, a lot yeah. of keyboards. Steve Winwood is still amazing on that. Do you remember Steve Winwood coming into the session? I sure do. You know, I've, I've always been a fan of Steve Winwood. As you read in the book, when I first saw Billy, he did a, a Winwood song, a traffic song where he was singing Colored Rain. I was 17 and he was 18 years old. And I, I thought to myself, wow, this guy's really good. And he's singing a song that I love. And uh, so when Movement came in, now I had studied traffic for the longest time. You know, I knew every lick. And when we actually told Billy, wow, I thought Jim Capaldi was playing drums when we were fooling around playing traffic songs. <laughs> you know, that's how close I got, you know, to doing that stuff. Oh, dear Mr. Fantasy. And, oh, gosh. <laughs> Yeah, it's I, a great the, record. Great in record. Your head. It's just amazing. And also uh, Cindy Lauper getting involved. The only co-writing credits he's had in the entire catalog. Yeah, she was amazing. I mean, uh, you know, I, I remember meeting her the first time. I did, she did a song for the Goonies uh, movie track. Flipside was called What a Thrill. It's, it's in the background of the movie. You can hear it in the background. And I came in and did the drums on that. And... Um, what a great lady. What a great lady. I mean, you know, the lyric that she wrote, that's deep. It's really deep. You know, Code of Silence. Yeah, it's, it's the, very catchy. And I thought that would be the A side. It was actually a B side to one of the singles. Yeah. Well, Beautiful. what a great, great song that is. I love that one. Yeah. And then even going back to her catalog, True Colors is just like, that's like an anthem. That's what it's become. So after the bridge, y'all went to the Soviet Union. Yes. And that must have been, I mean, I have Russian roots too. I always wanted to like go back and stuff. But these days, I don't know. It's, it's a little bit dicey yeah. over there. I just, you know, hearing how he made the connection with the Russian people through and the music. And these people were smuggling Beatles records in when they were young and. <laughs> Robert, I saw them in the, the, the woods. They would meet in the woods, probably about 20 of them. They all had boom boxes, right? One guy had a tape, Beatles tape. He'd put it in. The other guy, the other 19 people would press record. He would press play. And that's how they transferred the music to each other, like that. Or they could get a record that was actually recorded on old X-ray, uh, X-rays. They could record on that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it was amazing, amazing to see. It was like stepping back in time. You, know? you were there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Before the collapse, all that, it's, that was a groundbreaker. Yeah, yeah. 
The documentary is amazing. You're in that documentary about it. Uh, they explain why Billy wanted to go over there and do that. Few artists before him have ever done that. It right. Was just, what, a, what a nice story. You know, it was amazing too. It's like, uh, I, think I, I think I mentioned it in the book about that I went all American when I went there. You know, I had an American oh, yeah. flag on my shirt. I had yeah. the American pins. So Mickey Mouse was hanging off my jacket. No, everything American. Flags on my riser, on my uh, drum uh, cage and everything. And Billy actually asked me to tone it down at one point. Could you please tone it down? And I said, no. You know, so he was afraid that they were going to see this ugly American saying, boasting that I'm an American and you're not, you know. But um, the, the guy who was the translator for uh, Billy on, on stage, o Oleg, when we did the 25-year anniversary video, he was interviewed right after me. So in between my interview and, and his interview, he heard me say that about my clothes. And he said to me, he said, look, when they saw you up there and your arms just going all over the, all over the place and just feeling free, he said, when they saw that flag on your chest, it just represented freedom to them. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> I'll take that. It was phenomenal to see you hit the opening notes of Angry Young Man. And they're just like sitting there. And then it took a bit for them to really loosen up. And yeah. what a powerful song. Yeah, and that was pretty brave of Billy to do that, you know, the, the mosh pit thing, you know, where they carried him on, on you know? Yeah. I mean, that, 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 was, that completed the bridge to me. Yeah. I remember, yeah, getting that. <laughs> this goes back, I was in college when this came out. And you do see in here, I had you sign this when I, we met years ago. <laughs> uh, that's really funny. But yeah, I, I like how, you know, here you are with the, uh, the, the shirt. USA shirt. Yeah. Yep, yep. But going back to turnstiles, um, mm. that's an interesting story, how turnstiles, the record before The Stranger uh, has Say Goodbye to Hollywood, the single on there. And I didn't know that until you wrote in there he was yelling your name out towards the end of it. I was really yes. wondering. Did you listen to it? <laughs> yeah, I was like, all the years I've heard this song, <laughs> I'm in the car, I'm pumping up like, nah, I couldn't even understand. I thought he was saying, hey, Bobby, or hey, something like, you know, at the end there. I didn't know. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I was saying, hey, DeVito, to... where are you going? I just got enough to go to the bathroom or something. <laughs> What a great story. And also with, with Turnstiles, though, it was like trying to find the right producer. He ended up co-producing it or produced it himself? Yes. Yeah, he, he ended up uh, producing it, uh, you know, uh, and Brian Ruggles was an advisor, you know, because he wasn't in the union, so he couldn't be put on the album uh, as a musician or something like that. You know, you had to be in the union to get on the album because it was Columbia Records and they were tied in with the musicians' union. So, um, yeah, Billy produced it himself. And uh, I think, I don't think Columbia Records was happy with that idea because they had Jim Gerstio producing it before, you know? Uh, so I don't think they got behind it like they should have gotten behind it because Turnstiles has great songs on it. I mean, every, oh. time we played, every time we played live, even with the Lords, we're Turnstiles heavy. You know, Miami 2017, Angry Man, I've Loved These Days. You know, uh, it's so many. It's just, I'm a Highland Falls. It's a great song, you know? So, the early catalog is really good. I tell people, you know, people who like, you know how it is. It's like, here's a very successful solo performer, one of the biggest selling solo artists of all time. Right. And people get jealous of success. Oh, it's Billy Joel and all that. It's like you, the early catalog, you know, starting 1971 through 76, yeah, great songs. Really, yes. good stuff. wasn't produced to the satisfaction of Billy himself or, or anybody right. else in the record company. Well, on the um, uh, songs in the attic record, we we got to play. You know, uh, uh, everybody loves you now. Uh, that's way before me, but we got to play it, and it was what a great tune. You know, she's got away. A great song. You know, and the early stuff. I love Los Angelinos. Uh, all, you well, you play it so beautifully on there. Oh, it's way better than the original version. <laughs> it's the, the passion you have, and it's not just a kiss, butt or anything. I remember seeing you for the first time. I was for my 17th birthday. I went to see you at the Coliseum in Richfield, Ohio. Yeah. And you stood out. And when he introduced you, know, it's like, you don't remember the, you know, the band members' names, but 
you really stood out and the way you pounded with the passion, right. it just, that left an impression. Only other drummer you really paid attention to, maybe Neil Peart, maybe right. Ringo, Bill Collins, but you really stood out and, and really a, a very big part of the catalog. Um, but Songs in the Attic, was that, was it originally going to be that or was that going to be like a double album? Because they recorded everything on the Glass Houses tour. Was Phil thinking of just, you know, doing the rarities or how did that come about? You know, it's funny. I just, uh, I just emailed Billy and said, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of Songs in the Attic still around. Maybe you can put on another album. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, we recorded everything. You know, we were going from clubs to arenas, you know, to get different sounds. And of course, uh, in an arena, I love these days sounded better than in a club because they had the ambience and all that kind of stuff. Where, um, you know, the rock songs, you may be right, and stuff like that were better in a club. So, you know, they had to pick and choose. And there was a lot of stuff recorded there. Yeah, I think there could be another one. Uh, yeah. It might have been a, sec a double album, but uh, I think they kept it as a single. I don't know why. But. Yeah, since uh, Billy O's and so much more, you know, then uh, what comes out is are a lot of compilations. So he calls this one the scraps. <laughs> My life's compilation, which it's nice, but it's not like cohesive. Uh, no. They could keep releasing, you know, unre you know this previously unreleased material and, you right. know, make new singles out of those, but uh, well, She's Got know, Away was a good idea to do you it. You know what was cool that they, re that they released was uh, Carnegie Hall. That was cool because you can hear, you can hear scenes from an Italian restaurant before we recorded it with Phil. We had met Phil. He came to see us play at Carnegie Hall. That's where we met him. So we were already doing scenes and just the way you are. You know? So you can hear what Phil actually had done if you, if you played a Carnegie Hall version and then you play uh, the, the record. Just the way you are, he wasn't expecting that to be even on The Stranger. Uh, it was Phoebe Snow who <clears throat> talked him into putting it on there. And then one of his biggest hit singles. Yeah, yeah, huge. <laughs> I, you know, he's like, I know I'm a rocker, but here's the schmaltzy thing. But wow, it's uh, brought in an audience. It really did. It really did. Like Richie Canada says every night when we play it. Yeah, well, well, my kids' teeth were fixed with this film. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> but another big single you were on, My Life, which you kind of like avoided for a while. <laughs> <laughs> when you see the gold record, though, that all changes. <laughs> yeah, it all changed when I saw that. And I was like, ah. I still not, I'm not crazy about that song. I don't know why. It just, ah. It's okay. I think it's so much that it's overplayed. It's good, but it's so overplayed. It's great to hear in concert, but God, you know, anywhere you go, the dentist's office, there's my life. It's chasing yeah. you everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Most That's interesting thing is that it would, it would usually be the second song in, and then people around me would be getting high. I'm like, why are you getting high to my life? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. This is Billy's top 40 artists. I mean, Pink Floyd, I get. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. That's really fun. But uh, aside from Billy, you worked with Sir Paul McCartney. What was that experience like with uh, Phil Ramone was involved with those sessions? Yeah, yeah. David Brown was in on that. Dave LeBolt, who came to Russia with us, the keyboard player, he was in on that too. Um, how was that? <laughs> You're talking to the biggest Beatle fan in the world. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm standing in front of Paul McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is somebody who I had idolized. I finally Are made it here. Are you kidding me? This is insane. You know, talk about the road to get to somewhere. It's like, how did, what? I didn't even remember being on that road that got me there. You know? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was insane. I mean, the best part was in between. The, we did two songs. Um, and uh, in between those songs, we kind of jammed out. And Paul was playing piano on the sessions. So he was doing Little Richard and he was doing, you know, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and all that kind of stuff. It was insane watching him do that stuff. It was so great. It just seemed, he makes it look so easy. I've seen him in concert three times and it's like, yeah. it, 
doesn't look like he's working very hard at all. And it's just beautiful what comes out. Oh, God, maybe I'm amazed. And you know, the huge hit songs, Band on the Run, and going back to the Beatles classics, it's just, uh, it, it had to be an amazing experience growing up. I'm sure you remember when all the record, the Beatles records were coming out. Yeah, a yeah. Huge- oh, I had, I had them all. How to have them all, all the records. You know, it's, it's funny. Somebody asked me, like, uh, who would you like to uh, interview if you could... Uh, uh, what would musician would you like to be with, whether dead or alive? Who would you like to sit with for a little while and just talk to them? And I said, I'd like to sit with John Lennon because I would like to sit with him and be there in the room the first time he heard like Jet or something like that. Would he have <laughs> laughed? <laughs> Because he was on the other end of the spectrum. You had something like the Imagine Project come out. Yes. And here's his writing partner, you know, taking off with phenomenal hit singles. With pop, pop hits, like just one after another. Someone's knocking at the door. Like, where do you go? As John sing it, imagine there's no heaven. <laughs> oh, my God. How do you compare those two? One's so organic, so tuned into the political scene. The other one's, you know, happy-go-lucky and right. making all the money. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I remember, I think you guys did cover Lenneman back in the day, like 76, 77. I think on some record, I, I think oh, Billy was covering it, that song. Yeah, um, we did, uh, I got every reason on earth to be mad. I'll cry instead. That's the I'll song cry we did. Instead. Oh, I love that cover. Yeah, yeah we, we did that. It was the flip side of big uh, single. And I love your drums on Easy Money, how that starts off the whole album. It's just, it gives it so much of the power. It's like you captured the Rodney Dangerfield persona. Great movie, too, that the song is. Yeah. yeah. The first time I heard it, the playback of that, I was in a movie theater. And I went to see the movie. And I forgot that we did it. And I just heard, bop, 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 bop. It was like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's that was, just, that it's was exciting. That was an exciting moment, you know. Gosh, so you went in to do Glass Houses. This was going to be like, I'm doing pure rock and roll. We're going to hit the big arenas. Were you getting really ramped up and excited? Like Phil's involved with this. Uh, I love the use of sound effects too. Some critics, you know, the critics were getting to yeah. Billy in those days too. But the sound of the glass breaking and just sets the whole tone for what became phenomenal for, you know, 1980, 81, uh, that tour. Yeah, well, I think, I think that was Billy's punk album, you know, because uh, uh, I remember being in France and, and, and seeing the police. I went to see the police uh, when they were just breaking out. And uh, I told Billy about it. I said, let's see this band of police. Oh, my God. They're <laughs> phenomenal. You know? And, uh, you know, I, I, he listened. And uh, I think it was time, like, like we were talking about in the beginning, why Billy did the things he had to do. Well, one of the things was he had to follow the leaders at that time because punk was, you know, taken off. Anybody that stayed in the, um, the, the, the 52nd Street mood was, fell behind, you know. So Billy had the bright band to do the punk thing too. I mean, we could play basically anything, you know. So, um, you know, uh, other albums like... Um, uh, when we did um, Glass Houses, he said, I just want us to play in the studio and we'll just be able to duplicate it live. Just play what you would play live. Where in Nylon Curtain, he said to us, he says, I don't even want you to think about how you're going to duplicate this live. Whatever the song needs, that's what we're going to put on it. You know, so it was more complicated than Glass Houses was. I love that, you know, and that's what kept him so relevant is he was able to change and yeah. go from 52nd Street, all this jazz. Right? If you listen to Zanzibar, really, really jazzy. You go to a big arena of rocker record, punk record, class houses, and then back to a very involved technical record like right. Miles and Curtain. It's just like he's so good at changing and evolving. Right. Well, there's always, there's always one song that keeps the fan there, you know. Like uh, 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 52nd Street, of course, had my life. Uh, then, then Glass Houses, you know, it had, you may be right. And, and still rock and roll of me. It was like, and then, then uh, Nylon Curtain has Allentown on it. You know, it's like, and pressure, you know. 
Yeah, and he wanted to get more current events in there at that time. Right. He tapped into it. When a lot of people weren't really even doing that at that moment. Right. That's the only time he got political, writing songs, you know? Yeah. That, and uh, the Down East Deluxe is pretty political about the fishermen and all that, you know, the strain, the, the talk between them and the government and the laws of the sea and everything. Sure. I bet you could probably pretty much relate to that. You grew up in the same area, uh, yeah. New York. Uh, so Long Island, yeah. Long Island. I, you had um, some rivalries there too growing up and where you were, you were in Seaford and you had, you know, the yeah. and it just these, I mean, I, it's so funny because a lot of us can relate to that growing up and having a rival neighborhood nearby, the rival high school. Yeah. You know, you could tap into that. It's, well, that's the great thing about the book is that you can take this book and just put your name where I say, I did this, I did that. And you did the same things. You know, I had a guy write me and uh, uh, sent me a, a text. He goes, this book is so great. I can't believe it. I'm up to dirt bomb fights and porn magazines. I feel like I'm reliving my youth. <laughs> yeah. A lot of us can really connect with that. You don't really really. I didn't realize it at the time, but it's like, yeah. I mean, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Very same yeah. idea. Row houses. Uh, right. High schools, neighborhoods, you know. Yeah, you, know, you had the punks and you know the the mean people and I and all that stuff. So I mean, I think that's always translated in this music and why yeah. he becomes so phenomenal. Sure, we were uh, we grew up in blue collar families. Billy really wrote blue collar lyrics, and we were a blue collar band that blue collar people loved. You know, we, they can relate to us. You know, Billy came out and wore a tie loose and an ugly jacket and, and did the boxing things. It was like, he was Rocky all of a sudden, you know, the musical Rocky. I mean, we, we went to Australia when Rocky, the movie came out and the girls went nuts because, you know, he had that bug eyes and all that stuff. You know? <laughs> Never seen eyes that, but yeah, it's just yeah. And, and hands, you know, like I probably more piano hands, but he, I saw him up close those things it's like how does he play <laughs> these little keys with these big hands yeah he's amazing to watch you know between him and elton they both have these these amazing hands you know uh it was a treat to play with both of them at the same time you know what was that face to face tour yeah that had to be i i think you guys did rehearse down here in atlanta i think dave rosenthal told me this we did spoke with him yeah we did yeah it, it was that the the old Georgia Dome, which they imploded years ago. Yeah. That was the that was the first tour. The the rehearsal was done at the Georgia Dome. Yep. I, I remember seeing that, and I was like thinking, this would always be great if these two would get together and play, and they did, and they did it. What three tours? Oh, but, but I was I did it for ten years, just me, uh, you know. I, and I think he did it again after I left with Elton, you know. It's great seeing them take each other's uh, parts, uh, take yeah. each other's songs and, and do that. They were just, it was an incredible experience to see that and see you know, I, the people. I always felt that, uh, you know, people would say, what was the difference between you and Elton and, uh, you know, the, the two bands? And I always said that Elton and his band were better musicians than we were, but we were better entertainers than Elton's band was. You know, they just stood there in the suits, and you know, but we like, wow, you know, <laughs> rocked it out. Because a lot of people were like, after they saw Elton play, they were like, well, we got a little nervous, you know, which, how's Billy going to, you know, top this or equal it? You know, and it's like, yeah, it was easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure they were compared to quite a bit. Here's the piano player from the UK. Here's the piano player right. from us and i'm sure that was kind of a struggle too and it's a, but they really did always respect each other despite the personal right. differences yeah yep they did they really did well you know we always have these things in our lives it's like and it's it's your story is just incredible how you overcome a lot of these odds and whether it was in your childhood growing up uh you have a great chapter on uh your brother and yeah. You know, all these things, it's just, it's, it's a part of who we are. We don't get out of this alive either, as, as the book goes. And it's, it's a very inspiring story. To, and where do you think you get that strength from? Is that your, the, the roots, uh, from your grandparents, your ancestors? I, I feel like we, we can get these, these work ethics from our families and we yes. channel that. 
Yeah, we do. My mother always told me, now, now you got to remember my parents, they grew up, uh, through, my dad was in World War II, and my mom uh, grew up and she was very poor, you know, Italian family comes over from Sicily, my mom was born here in America, but the family's very poor. Uh, and, um, but my mother always told me that you always have to have a sense of humor, no matter what you're going through, you've got to find something that you can laugh about. She said, I feel sorry for people that don't have a sense of humor. I don't know how they get through life, you know, uh, and I got to agree with her. I think, you know, I think you find something funny in everything. I mean, you know. Yeah, I was in an area where I grew up in Cleveland. It was, it was a lot of, you know, half Jewish, half Italian. I mean, right. I always joked that it was a loud school I went because we always talk with our hands and all. And you had this with Billy, um, just that upbringing. And I know, you know, he had a hard scrabble roots too with his dad leaving. Yeah, and sure. He took up boxing, got into motorcycle, these kind of things. You know, it, it like contradicts itself. Boxing and playing the piano. It's like, I'm sure that had to make his mother quite nervous. Yeah, everything that would destroy what he became, he did. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think life. it's really interesting. He's a really, really smart person. I don't think he likes to talk too much about that, but he's very well read. Very well. I mean, um, you know, he, he used to read all the time when we were on the road. As a matter of fact, if he didn't have a book in his hand, he, back when everybody was smoking, he would read on the matchbook cover. He would just read everything that's on the matchbook cover. Yeah. I once told him, I said, put that thing down and, and talk to me. You know, always reading, always reading. He would have, uh, if, he, if he had three bathrooms in his house, he would have different books in each bathroom. That, and he would decide which one to go to and just to, to catch up on the book that he was reading. You know? It's really impressive. And somebody who didn't finish high school wanted to go to Columbia Records instead right. of university. It's, I'm always taken aback by that. It's something I don't think he likes to advertise very much, but uh, no. speaks in the music. I mean, it's, it's, that's what makes such a great songwriter. Yeah, I mean, you know, a, a friend of mine once said, Billy Joel can say in three minutes what it takes us a lifetime to say, you know? I uh, mean, that, that's amazing to me. Like the Beatles did that. And, you know, it's just crazy that they can do that. that that's a real gift. And to have, you know, to be able to translate <laughs> your thoughts into such a short amount of time. Uh, just really incredible. You go a little bit into uh, River of Dreams. Now, that was a different yeah. experience. No that way. was... <laughs> Produced by Danny Korchmar, who also produced James Taylor and people like that. Uh, right. Who were those Shelter Island sessions like? The Shelter Island sessions were pretty cool. I mean, uh, that, that's where you really saw the pressure of Billy because he didn't want to go to the city. He was living out in, uh, in uh, East Hampton at the t- Amagansett at the time. And he wanted to go home every night, you know, because he was with Christy Brinkley and and uh, he had the little daughter, Alexa, and he wanted to go home all the time. So he ends up building a studio in a boathouse. Because Shelter Island, nobody's going to go there in the wintertime. It's, you know, it's a summertime place. So we would have to drive out to the end of Long Island, get on a ferry and go to Shelter Island, then find the studio and, and record these songs that he had. Uh, it was insane because... The, the songs were coming out really good, but there was nobody in the, in the booth listening and no producer. He was producing them. Yeah, so yeah. there was nobody listening and going, that's really close. Try, do it one more time and I know you got it. But we, we you know, there's a, there's a tape of like, I did, I think I did like eight songs that eventually got on River of Dreams. You know, I did the eight of those songs and, uh, when uh, Danny played the songs for uh, the, the band that actually plays on River of Dreams, he played them the song and, and the band would go, what's wrong with that? You know, and Danny would get all upset. Like, I just, I don't want it. I want it different. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the only one I got on was uh, Shades of Grey. That's the, I put on that one. Yeah. And it was with this DVD set from the My Lives uh, set here where I think it was recorded in Germany. And by that time, you had a way different band. Uh, Mark Rivera had already been with you guys for a while on saxophone. Uh, but Crystal Talifero had joined yes. uh, the band. 
which gave it this extra sound and more of a of a wide sound. Yeah, you know, like I say in the in the, in the book, I think uh, Crystal's audition to be in the band was uh, what she played on "We Didn't Start the Fire," the conga drum part. You came That's down here. It was the Stormfront tour, I remember very well. And you had a, an Atlanta story. I remember uh, seeing you guys at that show as well. Very hot summer. <laughs> it was in 1990. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Oh, uh, I remember Billy not uh, taking to the heat too well at that show. I remember him talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. In Philly, I had a hot... It was hot that summer. Yeah, it was really hot that summer. Woof. Ooh. You have some good stories there with stuff where places where I lived in Cleveland, Atlanta, and, and near Athens, Ohio, where you had a little run, and that's where I went to school. <laughs> <laughs> the University of Miami is there, right? Near Ohio University. Uh, yeah. Miami University is near Oxford, which is closer to Cincinnati. Oh, okay. But yeah. Oh, I'm sure there are lots of stories on the road, that's especially in the early years. I had the pleasure to meet Jeff Shock. Who, yeah, Jeffrey. What a what a great guy. Yeah, yeah, he's the one that came with me to the when the police took me away. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish he could have written a book too, because I'm sure he had plenty of his own stories. Yeah, he he definitely did. He was he was with us for a while, you know, and then he worked in the office. Yeah, you know, so yeah, he had a lot of stories. Yeah, he when I missed. did, um, I was backstage three years ago when he came here. Billy came here, and I just noticed such a family-like atmosphere. There's a lot of camaraderie. Um, he seems to be very loyal to a lot of people who've been working with him for years. Yeah, the crew. The crew very guys, yeah. Brian Ruggles uh, and... Uh, yeah. Steve Cohen. Yeah. Incredible people, yeah. Well, it has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, the new book, which is now available like everywhere. I got this through Hudson Music. Yeah, you get it on Amazon. Yeah, it's on Kindle, Amazon.com. Yeah. And uh, it's nice. It must have been fun to uh, sign this. <laughs> you did get it early, didn't you? Your hand getting a little... Uh... <laughs> 2,000 of them. I signed like that. <laughs> well, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Liberty well, DeVito, drummer for Billy Joel and many other people. You work with a whole host of legends and uh, it's been fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Robert. It's been great.